Well, we're in this series, and this is week number two, so I'd encourage you to pull your message notes out, follow along. There's a lot of scripture today, and the title of today's message comes from a phrase that high school students all across America use on a regular basis, uh, typically once a week, and it's the phrase, what test? How many of you have ever said, what test? Like in high school, you showed up at class one day, totally unprepared, had no idea there was a test, and you said, what test? Uh, a friend of mine pastors in Oklahoma, and they were, they were interviewing for some staff, for some positions in their church. And when they do the interview process, they love to test the candidates without the candidates knowing that they're taking a test. And one of the tests they did with a certain candidate was they stole his rental car keys. You know, he traveled in, they, he's in meetings all day, and, and they saw the keys lying on the table, and so they took him and hit him because they wanted to see how he was going to react. They wanted to see if he was going to get frustrated or lose it and get aggravated or if he was going to immediately problem solve and figure it out. Because again, they're, they're hiring him to, to take care of people that they love in their church. They just wanted to know he had the right you know, ability to, to problem solve and not get frustrated. But he took a test and didn't even know it. And so often in life, we take tests that we don't even know we are taking. And the message today, let me just give a little disclaimer. If you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, the principle we're talking about today does not apply to you at all. You can just kind of sit and enjoy yourself today. But the principle we're talking about today is, is for people who have surrendered their life to Jesus. For those of us who consider ourselves to be Christian followers of Christ, we're going to be talking about it because many believers, many followers of Christ today do not even know that there's a test in the Bible, that there is a test in the Bible that we take. And every single time we get paid, we take that test. So let me just ask you for a moment, how many of you get paid once a month? Like once a month, it's just, you know, once a month pay. How many of you twice a month? I'm a, I'm a twice a month, 15th and the 30th. How many of you are weekly? How many of you never get paid at all? Like you just, you just want to get paid. Like you never get <laughs> Every time we get paid, the Bible says we take a test. And the test is, who are we going to thank with the first part of our income, the first part of all of our increase, whether it's a bonus, whether it's a salary, whether it's a gift, the test is who do we thank first? Who do we worship with the first part? Who do we give the, the first part to? Here's the problem. I know followers of Christ who give the first part to Visa. They thank Visa first. Other people will thank the mortgage company first. Other people think their car payment for, here's the problem with that. Visa does not have the power to bless your finances. That's, that, that's a problem. And so what I want to do today is, is we're going to talk about this test of who do we put first in our life. And the test is tithing. And what I want to show you today is tithing is very, very scriptural and it's all throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New. A lot of people think tithing is just, you know, one obscure passage in the Old Testament. Actually, it's all throughout Scripture, and I'm going to show you that today. But let me take you to one of the clearest and probably the most well-known passages on tithing in the Bible in Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, beginning in verse 6. It says, I, the Lord, do not change. And that's an important, important fact for you to understand. God does not change. God is the same yesterday as he is right now in the present and will be tomorrow in the future. He does not change. And then he says, so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. And that's just funny to me. God, God is basically saying, look, I'm God. I don't change. That's why I haven't killed you yet. And I don't know if that's funny to you, but that's, that's funny to me. Because he, he, in essence, he's saying, because I'm a God of mercy and grace, I haven't wiped you out yet. I don't change. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my ordinances, and we'll talk about that word in a moment, and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return 
to you, says the Lord Almighty. Now this phrase, says the Lord Almighty, you're going to see a lot in this chapter. And the reason is God wants to make it absolutely clear he's the one that's saying this. The God that does not change is saying this to us. This is not a man making this up. Malachi wrote it down, but Malachi simply dictated what God wanted Malachi to write. This is God speaking personally to us, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? In other words, how do we break your ordinances and how do we return back to you? So what is an ordinance? An ordinance is simply a principle of ordinary behavior. As a follower of Jesus Christ, as somebody who surrendered my life to Jesus, there are principles that are just ordinary behavior for those of us that follow Jesus. And the people are asking, how do we return to you? Like, like how, do we, how do we get back in line with your ordinances, these principles of ordinary behavior? And the next verse I'm going to show you, I, I'm, I'm glad it's here because... Because I want to prove to you that a pastor did not make this up. Like a preacher did not make up what is about to be said. And, and here's the very next verse. Will a mere mortal, will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. You steal from me. And you ask, how are we robbing you? How, how are we stealing from you, God? How is it possible that me, a mere mortal, a man here on earth, can steal anything from God? And look at God's response, in tithes and offerings, in tithes and offerings, you are under a curse. You're under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe, the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Now, something you're going to notice about the tithe in the Bible, it's always to be brought to a specific place, God's house, the storehouse, where we're spiritually fed. So in other words, the temple or the local church is where the tithe goes. We don't decide for God where the tithe goes. The, the tithe always, it, it always insinuates a specific place where God directs and commands it to go. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. Again, the phrase says the Lord Almighty. God wants you to know, I'm saying this. This is me speaking. See if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe. Now these are agriculturalists. You have to translate this to today's economy. What does that mean for you in today's economy, in today's you know, uh, finance system? Again, says the Lord Almighty. This is God speaking to us. Then all the nations will call you blessed for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. I want to remind you again that this is God that's speaking and it's the God that does not change. I do not change. Who I was yesterday, that's still who I am. And what he's saying to the children of Israel at this, at this moment in their history, he says, you've gone away. You are my children and you've gone away from my ordinary principles of behavior. See, what you have to understand is tithing throughout Scripture is an ordinary principle of behavior for God's children to thank God for all that he gives us, for our salaries, our bonuses, gifts. Tithing is how we thank him for all that he provides for us. And God is saying, you have gone away from my ordinary principles, and as a result, you're now under a curse. Now, God wasn't cursing them. I want to make it clear. God did not curse them. They, they voluntarily allowed themselves to be left under the curse. And I know a lot of people argue with me and say, well, no, Christians can't be cursed. The Bible says that Jesus bore the curse on the cross. Yes, that's talking about our salvation. But let me ask you the question. Does that mean, uh, you know, with that logic, does that mean I can live my life however I want to? to live my life, and my behavior will not result in any consequences at all. Like, there's not going to be any consequences for how I live my life. 
You see, a curse is simply a consequence of disobedience. If I, if I violate a principle, there's going to be a consequence. If I decide to jump off a building and violate the principle of gravity, they, there will be a curse coming shortly. If I go into a store and I steal from a store and I get caught for shoplifting, there will be a consequence for that behavior, and that consequence will not be a blessing in my life. It will be a curse in my life. And, and yes, we, we get the fact that God owns everything. Like, everything is the Lord's. We know that. But God entrusts us as stewards over it. And God says, I'm reserving 10%, the tithe for myself. And so God tells us, set apart the tithe. Set it apart for my house. And if you keep any portion of it at all, you're stealing from me because it's mine. It belongs to me. It's a strong word, isn't it? God uses that word in Joshua chapter 7. When, when he gave them the promised land, the first city they had to go in and battle with was Jericho. And God said, I want all of the gold, all of the treasure of Jericho brought to me, to my house. It's all mine. Which is interesting because in Jericho, God didn't ask for 10%. He asked for 100%. And you may ask, why did God want 100% of Jericho? Because it was the first city. He gave them all of the rest. He said, you give me the first. And what happened is one of the soldiers, Achan, kept some of the gold for himself. And God said, you have stolen from me. You have stolen from me because you kept some of what I gave you. You kept some of it when it was supposed to be returned to me. You've stolen and now you're under a curse. See, God is saying, you've stolen from me. And because of it, you're living under a curse. And I don't want you living under a curse. I love you, God is saying. I want to I wanna bless you. And the problem is you're voluntarily placing yourself under a curse because you voluntarily went away from God's ordinary principles of behavior. And as a result, you, you've allowed this to happen. You know, in the book, The Blessed Life, that, that I cannot encourage you enough to, to take a copy today, and if you've never read it, read it. I, I've got four weeks and 30 minutes a week to teach this. The book will help you go a lot deeper and, and get an even fuller understanding of it. But in the book, Robert tells a funny story. He's having an argument with God about this very passage of Scripture, Malachi chapter 3, because it, it is the clearest teaching uh, and the most famous teaching on tithing in the Bible. But one of the arguments many people have is tithing was Old Testament. And so Robert is having this argument with God. God, this is Malachi chapter 3. After Malachi 3 is Malachi chapter 4. After Malachi chapter 4 is Matthew chapter 1. This is 15 verses away. He said, God, couldn't you have held on for 15 verses? I mean, 15 verses and a lot of the arguments would go away. And God responded to him, Robert, I put it exactly where I wanted it to be. And here's the reason. Number one, tithing is a test. It's a test. It's a test of who has first in your life. It's a test of where does God rank in your heart. It is a test of your faith. See, even when people argue with me over tithing, it, and it's funny to me because people argue over, I, I don't have anyone argue with me over putting God first. Like when, when, I, when I teach a message about we need to put God first in our marriage, nobody argues with me. When I say we need to put God first in our family, nobody argues with me. When I say we need to put God first, in our, nobody argues. It's just this one area that people want to argue. And I always wonder, what is the spirit behind the argument? Like if you find yourself being defensive today and argumentative, take a step back and ask yourself, what's the spirit behind this? Why, why would somebody argue this in light of what God has done? When you really think about what God has given on our behalf, his son bled and died for our salvation, to be with him for all eternity. In light of that, why would we argue with God over 
You see, it's a test of our heart. Now, let me give you some working definitions today. There's a lot of Christians today that do not understand the difference between tithing and giving. Let me help you with it today. Tithing and giving are separate spiritual disciplines. They are not the same thing at all. It's like reading your Bible and praying. They're they're similar. They both involve God, but they're different disciplines. Tithing is not the same thing as giving. So let me give you some working definitions. Tithing is returning to God the first 10%. I'm actually going to teach on that in week three. It'll be the most important message of this series, and we'll talk about the first. But tithing is when we return to God the first 10%. Giving is when we willingly give above our tithe. So anything we do above the first 10% that is willing, again, Paul's very clear, giving always has to be willing and not manipulated Oftentimes, giving is called an offering in the Bible because we're offering it to God. The tithe is always returning to God, and offering is always giving to God. That, that's the difference. So what you'll notice throughout Scripture is nowhere in the Bible does it say, give your tithe to God. And the reason it doesn't say, give your tithe to God, is because you can't give something that does not belong to you, right? Right? I can only, re- if it's not mine, then all I can do is, let me, let me illustrate it like this. If, I, if I'm going out of town and Walter here on the front row takes me to the airport in my car, and I'm gone for a week, and, and while I'm gone, he, I, I, I let him use my car, and he's able to drive around and, you know, go have fun in my car. When I fly back a week later and Walter comes to the airport, imagine if Walter shows up to the airport in my car, and says to me, you know, this week my wife and I have been praying. And we really feel led of God to give you this car. I mean, no, he's not giving me my car. It's my car. He's returning the car to me. So what you need to understand about the tithe, the tithe is always returning or bringing. The offering or giving is always giving. So here's a question. Why did God choose 10%? What, what's significant about 10%? Well, one reason God chose a percent is so that it would be fair for everyone. Think about it. It's fair for everyone. It, it, it's, it's one penny out of every dime. Think about this. One penny out of every single dime, whether you make $30,000 a year, $300,000 a year, $3 million a year or $30 million a year, it's the same for everyone. One penny out of every dime belongs to the Lord. It's holy. It's set apart. Now, what's significant about the number 10? Why, why 10? Like, I understand the percent. Why 10? Well, when you study biblical numerology, numbers mean something in the Bible, and every number represents something. All throughout the Bible, the number 10 always represents test, test. It's always in regards to a test. Tithing is a test. Let, let, me, let me ask you some questions to, to help illustrate this. How many plagues did God test Pharaoh with? Say the answer out loud. Ten. Ten. How many plagues did God test Pharaoh with? How many commandments did God test the heart of Israel with? Ten. Now I'm going to ask you some more questions. You may not know the answer to these, but there's a theme here. So I think <laughs> you can pick up on it. How many times did God test Israel in the wilderness? How many times were Jacob's wages changed? How many days was Daniel tested? How many virgins were tested in Matthew 25? How many days of tested are mentioned in Revelation? How many disciples were there? Ah, just testing you. Wanted to make sure you weren't going to sleep on me here. Make sure you're still with me. That's right. And I don't know if you've ever thought about it like this. What's really amazing about this is tithing is a two-way test. It's not a one-way test. God is not simply testing our heart. In fact, this is the only place in the entire Bible God gives you permission to test him. Let's look at verse 10 again. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. God gives you permission to test him. 
Test me and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. God gives you permission to test him. This word test in the ancient Hebrew, the Old Testament was written in the Hebrew language. The word test comes from the word where they would test the purity of gold to see how the quality of the gold. God is saying, test me to see that I'm pure. Test me to see whether or not I will honor my word. Test me because I want to open the windows of heaven and I want to bless you, but it, it depends. It's going to depend on whether or not you're going to thank me with the first, whether or not you're going to believe. Believe that 90% of your income blessed by God will accomplish more than 100% of your income voluntarily left under the curse of this world. You know, one of the other arguments I get as a pastor is, well, well tithing was under the law. That's Old Testament. That, that's under the law. We're not under the law anymore. We're under grace. This is the, the New Testament. And honestly, I don't understand that argument at all. Does that mean if it was wrong under the law that it's somehow right now? Like under the law, it was a sin to murder somebody. Thou shalt not murder. Are you trying to tell me that it's okay now? Let, let me ask all of the married women a question for a moment. All, all of the married women, let me just, let me speak to you just for a moment. Under the law, in the Old Testament, under the law, it was a sin for your husband to commit adultery on you. The Bible was very clear. Under the law, thou shalt not commit adultery. Now, you're New Testament Christians now under grace. Let me ask you, is it okay now? Like, like, do, are, are, do, <laughs> I mean, do you have the attitude to say, oh, we're under grace now. Go have fun for the weekend. <laughs> of course, not. I don't understand the logic of it at all. That argument doesn't make sense to me. If it was wrong under the law, it's still wrong. And if it was right under the law, it's still right. See, the law was never to penalize us. God, God, God didn't say, thou shalt not commit adultery to take our fun away. He did it to enhance our marriages. He did it to make our relationships more beautiful and to make our marriages more secure. God did it to protect us out of love. So all of the law and the principles of the law were done out of love. And they're principles that are still true today. So this brings me to the second point. Number two, tithing is biblical. Tithe, again, many people think there's just one scripture on tithing, and I'm going to show you in a minute. It's all throughout the Bible, but, but let me first say, if you're here today and, and you don't believe that tithing is biblical, you're not a bad person. You're not even a rebellious person. Here's the thing. There are many Christians today who do not believe tithing is biblical, and the reason they don't believe it is because they've never been taught scripture. They've been taught this from one of their friend's personal opinions. They've been taught this by somebody who, who, who never studied the Bible, just the way somebody felt about it. And so I want to show you throughout the Bible what, what God's word actually says. So again, the argument is tithing was under the law. Actually, tithing predates the law. I'm going to take you back 500 years before the law right now. Week number three, I'm going to take you back 2,500 years before the law and show you that tithing was around. But here's 500 years before the law, Genesis 14. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem and a priest of God most high. Now, Melchizedek, the word Melchizedek means king of righteousness. King of righteousness. Many theologians believe that this was Jesus Christ personally in the Old Testament. Like this was Jesus personally personally in the Old Testament. And, and if you don't believe it was Jesus personally, they believe he was a surrogate of Jesus. And here's the reason. Hebrews tells us that with Melchizedek, he had no beginning and he had no ending. Well, the only one that had no beginning and had no ending was Jesus. And it's king of righteousness. And he was the king of Salem, which was the ancient Aramaic word where we get the Jewish word shalom, the greeting shalom, which means peace. Salem eventually became Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the capital of Israel. And he brought Abram some bread and wine. Now Galatians tells us Abram, Abraham is our father and our example who we are to follow. 
Melchizedek blessed Abram with this blessing. Blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high who has defeated your enemies for you. Now look how Abraham responds. Then Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth. A tenth. The word tithe in Hebrew, mahashara, means a tenth part or 10%. That's what the word means. Abram tithe of all the goods he had recovered. That's 500 years before the law was ever established. 400 years before the law, Genesis 28. And this memorial pillar I have set up will become a place for worshiping God. Again, the tithe goes to the place where we worship God. What is the place where we worship God? It's the church. And I will present to God a tenth of everything he gives me. Leviticus says one-tenth, a tithe of the produce of the land, whether grain from the fields or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord and must be set apart to him as holy. This, this verse right here is the reason God can say, you're stealing from me. This is why Malachi can say, when you keep any portion of the tithe for yourself, you're stealing from me because it's God's. The first 10% of all that, we, all that we receive is God's. Deuteronomy says, and it shall be when you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you. God's giving you as an inheritance. So everything we have comes from God and you possess it and dwell in it that you shall take some of the first First, again, you'll see in a moment that this is talking about the tithe. The tithe is always first of all the produce of the ground, which you shall bring from your land that the Lord your God is given you. Again, God is giving them everything and put it in a basket and go to the place. Again, it's always a place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. Then you shall say before the Lord your God, I have removed the holy tithe. That was the first it was talking about from my house. It was the tithe. I've removed it from my house and also have given them to the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, according to all your commandments, which you have commanded me. Let me explain that. He wasn't giving generously because he saw people in need. He was giving out of obedience. This was the tithe, not an offering. And at this point, God was directing him how to spend the tithe. Because there's a lot of people think that I can, you know, give a little bit of my tithe here and give a little bit of my tithe here and help a missionary here or homeless ministry here. No, we don't have permission to designate God's money for him. We, we only return it the way he, he sets. And so God commanded him how to handle the tithe. I have not transgressed your commandments, nor have I forgotten them. I have not eaten any of it when in mourning. That's, that's an important phrase. That means I didn't spend any of the tithe on myself when I went through a hard time. Like when we had a bad month financially, I didn't keep any of it for myself. Nor have I removed any of the tithe for an unclean use. How many times do people use money and they spend it on sinful things? And I wonder, how often are they actually using that which is holy, the tithe, and using it for sinful things, nor given any of it for the dead? I have obeyed the voice of the Lord my God and have done according to all that you have commanded me. Look down from your holy habitation from heaven and bless your people. Let me ask you a question. If Jesus himself, Jesus, God's son, who went to the cross, who bled and died on our behalf. If Jesus himself, and I'm not talking about, you know, in Paul's writing, Paul quoting to him or referring to him, but in the actual red letters of the New Testament, of the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if Jesus himself said that you should tithe, would you do it? Here's the thing, I know people who would still struggle or argue over it. Even if Jesus, in the red letters from his own lips, said that you should tithe. Well, let me show you, because he did say it. Matthew 23, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your 
herb gardens. The Pharisees were tithing with all the wrong heart and all the wrong motives, and they were doing it for religious show, that they were tithing off of their spices for their, for their salads and their food. He says, you ignore the more important aspects of the law. Your heart's in the wrong place, and you're ignoring justice, mercy, and faith. Now, let me say, right now, Jesus has the golden opportunity to end the debate. He can end the debate right here. He can simply say, that was my dad. That was Old Testament. We're in the New Testament. We're under grace now. Tithing doesn't apply to us anymore. You need to focus on the important things. Forget about tithing. That was Old Testament. This is what you need to be doing. Look at how Jesus responds. You should tithe yes. That's his lips. I mean, what more do we need? This is Jesus who died for us, telling us we should tithe, but do not neglect the more important things either. He's saying there's many aspects to the Christian life. Don't leave this one undone. Now, why would Jesus tell us we should tithe? Because he understands the significance of what it will do in our life. And here's something you may have never thought about before. Hebrews 7 says, in the one case, the tenth or the tithe is collected by people who die, but in the other case, it's collected by him who is declared to be living. Now, who, who is him who is declared to be living? That's Christ. He lives. He lives. He lives. So what this is saying is on earth, men who die collect the tithe. So when you tithe, at Coastline Church, our accounting team and finance team, they will collect the tithe, and they will die one day. They're not going to live forever. And so they will collect the tithe, and they will account for it, and they will budget for it, and they will, they, they, they will make sure that it's all handled correctly. But here's what Scripture is telling us. When you tithe on earth, men who die receive it, but in heaven, Jesus receives it. Every time you tithe on earth, in heaven, Jesus receives your tithe. Pretty powerful, huh? Here's point number three. Tithing is a blessing. Tithing is a blessing. We're going to look at 2 Chronicles chapter 31. Let me give you some background. Hezekiah just becomes king of Israel. Hezekiah is 25 years old, and he becomes king of Israel. And Israel was in ruins at this point. Israel had fallen apart. They were going through one of the worst times financially, economically, the nation had ever been through. It had been destroyed and decimated. There was famine. There was drought. It, it was a very difficult time. And this young 25-year-old king set about to put everything back in order. And one of the things he realized, one of the reasons the nation had been cursed, one of the reasons the nation was struggling is because they were neglecting the tithe. It's one of the things that he reinstituted. Let me show you in scripture. In addition, he required the people in Jerusalem to bring a portion, and in a moment, it'll use the word tithe to describe this, of their goods to the priests and Levites so they could devote themselves fully to the law of the Lord or teaching the word of God. Now remember, Malachi says, bring all the tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in the house. There can be food to feed people in the house. And now it's saying, bring the tithe so that the priests and the Levites can devote themselves to the ministry of God. So let me ask you a question. Do you enjoy the food in this house? Do, do you enjoy the spiritual food that we serve every week around here? A couple weeks ago when I taught on stress and anxiety, I don't think I've ever received more text messages and emails thanking me for that meal we provided because it helped people in so many different ways, deal with stress, deal with anxiety, begin to sleep again. And so people said, thank you for that. That, that really blessed me, ministered to me. Do you enjoy the food in this house? Well, let me say, somebody's paying for it. And I'm not trying to be blunt or offensive, but I need to be honest for a moment. And I'm not just talking about me to prepare these messages every Sunday. I'm talking about all of it, the, the facility, the lights, the utilities, our children's director and the, the whole children's team that's caring for our children today. 
the youth ministry and our youth pastor and the, the life small groups that have blessed so many. Somebody's paying for all of that. Now let me ask you another question. Would you ever go to a restaurant here in town, enjoy a nice meal, and then skip out on the check? Would you ever do that? There are Christians who do that every week. There are Christians who sit in church every Sunday. They enjoy a nice meal, spiritual food that was provided, and then they skip out on the check. And again, if you're not a Christian, this doesn't apply to you. But for those of us that follow Jesus, this, this happens every week. And here's the thing, you're hurting yourself. You're the only one being hurt. Let me make it absolutely clear. We're not doing this series or this message because the church is in need. The elders hadn't come to me and said, you know, you haven't talked about, you know, giving and tithing in a while and we're struggling to make payroll. You need to teach about this because, you know, the church is in need. Can I tell you, we're, we're the best, this is the best year we've ever had. We are so far ahead of budget right now. The month of September was the largest month financially for the entire year. We're, we've already made budget for the year. Like we're not doing this because we're in any type of need at all or any type of struggle at all. I was in Dallas this week with Pastor Robert and his team and, and one of his key guys was, was looking at our church and we were talking about the finances and they were shocked because Coastline Church is one of the most generous churches in all of the United States per capita. Our giving and tithing is way above average for churches in America. So I wanna make it clear, we're not doing this series because of us being in any type of need at all. My heart is for you. I'm teaching this for the very same reason I teach on faith, prayer, marriage, or anything else. I want to help you. And tithing's a blessing. So let's look at how the people respond. When the people of Israel heard these requirements, they responded generously by bringing, remember you can't give the tithe, you can only bring or return it, bringing the first share of their grain, new wine, olive oil, honey, and all the produce of their fields. They brought a large quantity, a tithe, of all they produced. The people who had moved to Judah from Israel and the people of Judah themselves brought in the tithes of their cattle, sheep, and goats, and a tithe of the things that had been dedicated to the Lord their God, and they piled them up in great heaps. They began piling them up in late spring, and the heaps continued to grow until early autumn. There was a spring harvest season and a fall harvest season, and this was happening all year long. When Hezekiah, the king, and his officials came and saw these huge piles, they thanked the Lord and his people, Israel. Where did all this come from, Hezekiah asked. Now, let me, let me help you understand this question. Hezekiah is a good king, and he has a good heart for his people, and, he, and he's seeing these massive piles. He's seeing these piles of the tithe and the offerings, and he's concerned. He's worried, and here's what he's concerned about. He's thinking that the people are giving too much. They're giving more than 10%. They're giving so much that the people are still starving. The people are still living destitute and in poverty because they're not giving 10, they're giving it all to God, and they're sacrificing and suffering because of giving all this to God. And any good king would react that way. Any king with a good heart would feel that way. And so that's what's going on. Where did all this come from? Are they giving more than they're supposed to give? It's just the tithe. They're not, they're not to give more than the tithe right now. It's just a tithe. And, and, and that's all we've enacted. And Azariah, the high priest from the family of Zadok, replied, King, since the people began bringing their gifts to the Lord's temple, since they began bringing the tithe to God's house, we have had enough to eat and plenty to spare. The Lord has blessed, blessed his people. And all of this, this is just the leftover. In other words, Azariah is saying, King, this is just the 10%. This is nothing. You want to see something that's impressive? Go look at the 90%. 
Like this is just the tithe. This is just these huge piles. That's just 10%. Go look at what God has done in the 90%. The people are blessed. Things have turned around. Finances have turned around. Economy, they are so blessed. It's pretty powerful. It's pretty powerful. I don't, you know, in 20 something years of ministry as a pastor, I've basically heard two testimonies in regards to tithing. Two testimonies. The Bible says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let a thing be established. From tithers, I've consistently heard the same testimony I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Doesn't mean they're rich, doesn't mean they won a lottery. Oftentimes, the blessing they're talking about is not money at all. Like I, I had someone this morning say, they, we started tithing and, and for 10 years we tried to get pregnant and couldn't get pregnant, couldn't have a child, physically impossible. We started tithing and my wife got pregnant within a month. So can I say tithing is not just about, the blessing isn't just about money. It's, it's about when you put God first in your life, it's the blessed life. The second testimony I've heard consistently is I can't afford to tithe. I can't afford to tithe. I, I, I just can't afford to tithe. Can I say you'll never be able to afford to tithe until you tithe? Because it's tithing that breaks the curse. So tithe, and, and tithing might be a little more personal Jesus than you really realize. Let me illustrate it like this. Um, Todd, Walter, Josh, can you come stand right here for me? Just the three of you, just stand right here for, for just a second. I want to illustrate something to you. Just you guys just stand together over here. Thank you, guys. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be going on a trip, and I'm going to be gone for like three or four months. And while I'm gone, I want my, my wife taken care of. She's my bride, and I love her. I love her. And I want her taken care of while I'm away. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give each of you guys $10,000 a month. Now, don't get excited, Josh. It's just an illustration. <laughs> he's a youth pastor, so, you know, he's getting excited over there, and he's getting married soon, so... Uh, I'm going to give each of you $10,000 a month. Now, it's my money. It's my money. I'm going to give you 10. And all I, this is all I want you to do. I just want you to take $1,000 and give it to my wife every month. Look, I'll let you keep the other $9,000. You can do anything you want with the other $9,000. All, all I'm asking is you just take $1,000 of my money and, and give it to my wife every month to take care of her. And so I head off on my trip. Well, a few months into the trip, I call my wife because I want to check on her. I want to make sure she's okay. She's my bride. I love her. So I say, hey, baby, how, how, how's it going? She says, well, you know, Todd, every single month, first of the month, $1,000 check in the mail. It's always the first of the month, $1,000 check every single month. <laughs> I said, that's great. I said, how's Walter doing? She goes, first month, Walter sent $2,000. I said, $2,000? I said, I didn't ask him for two. I just asked for $1,000. Why did he send $2,000? I don't know why he sent He just sent $2,000. Second month, he sent $3,000. $3, $3,000. How's Josh doing? We need to talk about Josh. <laughs> I said, what's going on with Josh? She goes, well, the first month, Josh sent $300. $300. Wow. Second month, I didn't hear from him. Third month, I didn't hear from him. What do you think I'm going to do? This is my bride. I love her. It's my money. I'll tell you exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to stop sending it to Josh. And I'm going to divide it up between these two guys because I can trust them. I can trust them. You guys can be seated. L listen to me. Jesus said, I'm going away for a while. And I'm going to come back. And while... I'm gone. I want you to take care of my bride. I want you to take care of my bride. The Bible's clear. The bride of Christ is the church. Tithing might be more personal to Jesus than you think it is. He loves his bride. It might be more personal. And it's a blessing. You know, a couple years ago, I was teaching this message, and one of the moms in our church came to me after the service, and her husband was in Afghanistan. He's a Marine, low-ranking Marine. 
they had three children, and they just struggled on their salary. I mean, every month was a struggle for them. She told me, I have to borrow money every single month to feed my kids. I can't make it through the month without borrowing money to feed my kids. She goes, I can't tithe. I can't afford to tithe. There's, there's, I have to borrow money to feed my, there's no way I can tithe. Honestly, that's difficult as a pastor. Because I would love to, to be able to say, you know what? God understands your situation. You're an exception. You, you can violate this principle. But I realized that if she's struggling to live off of 100% of our income, she can't afford not to tithe. Like she can't afford not to do it. And so I told her, I said, tithing is a test. It's a, it's a test of your faith. It's walking on water. It's trusting God that he'll come through. A couple months later, she came to me and she says, you're not going to believe it. I said, what? She goes, we started tithing. The last three months are the first three months in over a year that we have not had to borrow money from our family to get through the month. She goes, we haven't got a raise. I don't understand it. It makes no sense. When we lived off of 100% of our income, we had to borrow money to survive. Now that we're living off of 90% of our income, we're making it through the month. 90% is actually stretching further than 100% used to go. Because it's a supernatural principle. It's, it's a blessing of God that works. So as we close today, let me just say, if you struggle with tithing, I don't want you to feel condemned at all. Uh, th there needs to be no shame. If this is an area you should, for me, I don't struggle with it at all. But here's the thing. There may be areas in my life that I struggle with that you don't struggle with. So I don't want there to be any shame or any condemnation if you struggle about this area. But what I do want is you to feel convicted. Conviction is good. And what I do want is for everyone here to ask the Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me about this message? What are you saying to me? And here's the thing. If he asks you to give up certain things in your lifestyle to be able to tithe, he's got the ability to add them back to your life. It's worth it. It's worth it. I've seen people had to sacrifice to be able to start tithing and where they ended up a year later was incredible. I mean, the testimonies in our church, again, I love this series because more people have thanked me for this series than anything else we've ever taught in this church because they've seen the blessing of God in their life in such amazing ways. And it's not, and again, half of it has nothing to do with finances. It's, it's so many different areas of their life. Would you close your eyes with me? Before we leave today, for those of you that are not Christ followers, let me make it absolutely clear. The only giving God wants from you today is your heart. God doesn't want any of your money right now. God wants your heart. He wants to be a part of your life. He wants to be family with you. And what I would like to do is lead you in a very simple prayer where you can give God your heart. I'm not going to ask you to stand up. and You don't even have to pray this prayer out loud. But if you're here today and you say, you know what? I want to give my heart to God today. I need to, I need to give my life to God. Or I need to give my heart back to God. And you understand what that means. If, if that's you, I'd like to lead you in this simple prayer. And just so I know who's joining me with every eye closed out of respect, would you just slip up your hand if you'd like to join me in that simple prayer and then put it right back down. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Is there anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate those hands. The prayer is simple. Just in your heart right now, say, Jesus, today I give you my heart and my life. Forgive me for all the times I've sinned against you. Thank you for your grace and thank you for your forgiveness in Jesus' name.